The original run of Family Feud with Richard Dawson began in 1976, kicking off a spectacularly successful run that consistently occupied the number one spot in network daytime and evening syndication. But by the mid-80s, the show's ratings were drooping thanks to general overexposure, ill-devised format changes, and the meteoric rise of Wheel of Fortune. Both versions of the show came to a dignified end in 1985, after which Dawson basically retired, and it seemed like the story of Family Feud had come to a decisive end, as must happen to all good things, right? Smile because it happened. Ah, what the heck, enough time has passed, this format still has life, let's bring back the feud. Family Feud was created by Mark Goodson, who didn't believe that the 1985 cancellation was so much an end to the show as the beginning of a brief little hiatus. After all, the format of the game was strong, and he believed that with a few tweaks, it was still as viable as ever. So around early 1987, he reassembled the Family Feud staff and set out to make a revival. The show was going to be largely the same, you know, Goodson believed in the format. He just had one crucial change that needed to be made. No more Richard Dawson under any circumstances. This revival project was staffed by more or less the same crew of people that had worked on the original show, and nine years of dealing with the demanding, brash, egotistical nature of Dawson had eliminated the possibility of any of them willingly working with him ever again. So Goodson and his trusty producer Howard Felsher set out on the search for a new host. And from the beginning, Felsher had a guy, one who will probably surprise you. His name was Joe Namath. Broadway Joe, Joe Willie Namath. Namath is one of the most prolific football stars of all time. He was the quarterback for the University of Alabama under coach Bear Bryant in his college days, during which time he led the team to a national championship, and he played for the New York Jets afterward, leading them to their first and, as of 2021, their only Super Bowl win in 1969. But he was more famous as a media personality, having hosted a successful talk show for a season in 1969 and maintaining a consistent presence in pop culture thereafter, whether through acting, sports commentating, or Ovaltine commercials. My old pal Ovaltine. He was quite the personality, and even by 1987, he was still well within the public eye, and Howard Felsher really wanted him to host Family Feud. And when Namath was approached, he was receptive to this idea and agreed to come aboard the project. For months, it seemed as though this revival was gearing up to have Joe Namath as its star. He taped numerous run-throughs in the studio with real families, and boy, what I would give to see these run-throughs. If you ever watch Joe Namath, he's got this distinctively laid-back air about him. He speaks slowly, his voice has a bit of a drawl. He always seems calm and relaxed, borderline aloof. So he was an interesting choice for a job naturally associated with high energy and enthusiasm. As the show's development continued, it seemed like a lock for Broadway Joe, who ultimately signed a contract with the Family Feud logo on it. But soon after, Mark Goodson began having second thoughts. Enthusiasm around Joe Namath was split among Family Feud staff, and as the revival progressed, Goodson was becoming less comfortable with the idea of casting him. Ultimately, for reasons we'll never truly know, he decided that Joe Joe Namath just wasn't the guy, and he vetoed his candidacy. So the search for a host continued. You know, it's always a tricky task to find a personality that can effectively perform the traffic cop elements of the show while still having enough personality to keep the show entertaining. Finding one or the other was easy, but threading the needle between the two is tough, which is part of what makes game show hosting so difficult. But soon after Namath was canned, they found the man for the job. His name was Ray Combs. Ray Combs- wait, what's his full name? Raymond Neal Combs Jr. was a comedian who had started performing in his native Ohio during the late 70s, later moving to Indianapolis to sell furniture while doing his comedy on the side. In his early days, his signature bit was one in which he would have his audience sing along to, quote, the worst TV theme songs. After writing a letter to hometown hero David Letterman for some words of encouragement, he decided on a whim to move from the Hoosier State to Los Angeles in 1982 so he could pursue a career in comedy. Against all odds, he was actually met with decent success, and it wasn't long before he entered the ultra-glamorous world of sitcom audience warm-up. Back in the days when sitcoms were everywhere and actually had real studio audiences, there would always be a lot of downtime before and in between scenes, so the show would bring in a guy to fill the time with laughter and keep the audience cheery. Given the amount of time to fill and the fact that the audience wasn't really there to listen to some no-name comedian tell jokes, the warm-up comic was actually a tough and thankless position. But Ray Combs quickly gained a reputation as the master of the format. While he was working sitcoms like The Facts of Life and The Golden Girls, his sets became known for often enough garnering bigger laughs than the shows they were accompanying, and production crews were known to alter their schedule 
schedules around the availability of Ray Combs. One of those sitcoms he worked, Amen, was made by a company called Carson Productions, and the namesake Carson was Johnny Carson, the host of The Tonight Show, who decided to attend a taping of his sitcom one day. He was backstage before the cameras even started rolling, and he noted the uproar coming from the crowd reacting to some warm-up comic. Carson was intrigued, and he directed his staff to look into the guy that seemed to be bringing the house down. They did, and they booked him for an appearance on The Tonight Show in October of 1986. And here is Ray Combs. Oh. I can't, I'm deciding whether or not to sign the back of my driver's license to donate my organs when I die. Now, I, I think this is a good thing, but I'm kind of afraid because we literally have no control over whose organs they give us. I had a nightmare that my vision went bad, and they gave me the eyes of a guy who was killed when he pulled out in front of a bus that he didn't see. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, just say one thing. My entire life, I always had a dream that someday I'd be able to walk out on this show and make people laugh. And tonight, you made that dream come true. Thank you and good night. That's the guy who knows how to do it. His set was very well received, so much so that the audience responded to it with a standing ovation, an extreme rarity for a first-time comedian on Tonight. Johnny invited him to take a seat and banter for a little while, the telltale indicator of success after doing a set in front of those fabled curtains. The appearance did exactly what Ray was hoping for, boost his comedic clout, and open the floodgates for appearances and gigs. He accepted a few of them, which landed him a slot on Hollywood Squares for a time in early 1987, but it was when he entered talks with the bright minds behind Family Feud that he felt he was a approaching his big break. Goodson and Felsher were both aware of Ray after his tonight's show appearance and subsequent blip of popularity. At age 31 and standing 5 foot 8, Combs had an everyman appeal. His comedy was accessible, he had a bright personality, and he had a generally unassuming demeanor, all of which rendered him a fairly safe choice for the job. Sure enough, after enough run-throughs, the show's staff rallied around Ray Combs, with Mark Goodson being especially enthusiastic about this fresh talent. We are ready to tape a pilot. One thing though, who's going to fund it? Which network is going to want this show? Well, let me introduce you to a man named Michael Brockman. I've actually talked about Brockman before. He was the figure at CBS most instrumental in giving Pat Sajak a late-night talk show. Click here if you don't know that story. But he's relevant here because he was a hotshot at ABC during the mid-70s when Family Feud was still being pitched. I mentioned in part one that Family Feud went to ABC since that's where Fred Silverman was by this point, which I later learned might have played a small role, but that's not the real reason. Family Feud still had to be pitched around just like any other show. I mentioned that NBC passed on an early version of the concept based on run-throughs and had no further interest. So the show was taken to ABC, where Michael Brockman worked at the time, and he responded positively to the idea, and he worked closely alongside Mark Goodson and his creative crew to revise and improve the format for what they all hoped would be a run on ABC. Run-throughs continued, and Brockman eventually became positive enough in the show that he was ready to commission a pilot. One problem, though, he didn't actually have the authority to do that. He needed approval from ABC brass, particularly Michael Eisner. Yes, that Michael Eisner. Before he was CEO of Disney, he was in charge of programming at ABC. Eisner wasn't giving Brockman an answer, and Goodson's team was growing impatient, threatening to take the concept to CBS. Brockman was friends with many on Goodson's team and didn't want to let them down, so they agreed on a hard deadline to get a decision from ABC. The day arrived, still no answer, so Brockman was preparing to enter an executive's office for what could have ended up being an unpleasant meeting, because he was going to fight for the project aggressively if needed, because it was less than an hour until Family Feud got put in front of CBS. But as he was gearing up for this conversation, Brockman actually ran into Eisner in a hallway, where Eisner Eisner casually gave the approval for the concept to proceed. And that's the story of how Family Feud ended up on ABC. This one guy really went to bat for it. So when Goodson was trying to bring it back 13 years later, who do you think he called? By this point, Brockman was working at CBS, where he was in charge of daytime and late night, and his rank at CBS meant that he didn't have to answer to as many people to get a show on the air. Goodson reached out to Brockman early in the development of this revival, and Brockman was enthusiastic about the idea. Not only did he like Family Feud and the team that made it, he thought the wild success of Family Feud's first incarnation could potentially be replicated. So as soon as the revival was presented to him, he took steps to acquire the broadcast rights for CBS. He again worked alongside the creative team as the show was in development, and once again, his network agreed to foot the bill for a pilot, taped in August of 1987. Right off the bat, the thing that sticks out about this pilot is the set. Gone is the hokey wood grain antique look of the Dawson version, and in was a bolder color scheme with a lot of blue and a lot of red. Also gone was the needlepoint on the family backdrops. Hallelujah. 
They updated the board and the buzzer and generally gave the whole show a visual overhaul even if the set still maintained the same layout. And then out walks Ray Combs, and it's natural to want to compare him to his predecessor. Ray and Richard both started in comedy, and they both like to invade the personal space of Fast Money players, but that is about where the similarities end between the two. Now, I am not a critic, and it's a bit difficult to put this all into words, but here is my best attempt. Dawson's comedic style and his hosting style never really betrayed a comedic background. He was always at ease. His remarks and wry quips seemed not to be to get laughs out of the audience, but more to just charm whoever he was talking to. He was always very well put together, and he drew upon his persona of being a cultured Briton to seem like the coolest figure at a black tie social event, when really he's talking to Jim Wright from West Virginia on the set of a game show with needlepoint birds in the background. His appeal came from this vague idea that he is better than the people he's interacting with, but he was willing to treat them like his peers, as if to let us all in on a sect of society that we'll never really be a part of. That's a lot of words to say that Richard was cool, relaxed, and effortlessly witty. On the other hand, Ray did betray a comedic background. In this pilot episode, I think the biggest difference in how he interacts with the families, aside from the fact that he's not kissing everyone, thank god, it's that everything he says seems deliberate. He's always hunting for a joke, or something he can spin into a joke, you know, just some punchline somewhere. Uh, I'll say where Omar Gaddafi is from Libya. Libya. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm not afraid of this guy Gaddafi because I don't think he's real bright. <laughs> think about this, he took over a country and he made himself a colonel. <laughs> That's it. General, right? I guess you could say the comedy of this pilot is much more in the setup followed by punchline category, where Richards was more offhanded and looser because he was sharp and versatile enough to pull that type of comedy off. This is not to say that one is better than the other. Ray is genuinely funny at points. He is a seasoned comedian after all, and he definitely gets laughs, even if not quite everything lands. And for what it's worth, he plays the traffic cop part of the role very well, which is less obvious just because there's nothing wrong with the way he does it. And besides, pilots are all about showcasing potential. Nothing is ever fully baked on the first go. It's just that Family Feud was going to have a different feel and energy about it, but different does not inherently equal worse. And it would seem that CBS agreed with me on that, because on the strength of this pilot, they picked up the show for the 88-89 season, setting it to air at 10 a.m. for the usual half hour. And as it would turn out, the pilot made its rounds in the syndication circuit as well. Network daytime was cushy and nice, but the money was in evening syndication. Family Feud's original run in syndication, and now Merv Griffin's Wheel of Fortune Plus Jeopardy powerhouse, were showing that a hit in syndication could take the nation by storm and basically print money for everyone involved. So if Family Feud was going to reclaim its bygone popularity, syndication was going to be a big piece of the puzzle. This time around, the show found a buyer right off the bat in LBS Communications, a major player in television syndication, but one known more for scripted shows than game shows. But LBS was not playing around. They gave the show a $20 million budget and proceeded to drum up enormous hype for the revival within the television industry. You see, by this point, almost 10 years since Family Feud originally showed how powerful evening syndication was, the amount of programming in those time periods had soared. Everyone wanted a piece of this pie, and there was only so much to go around. Any big project being shopped around was a risk. If the show didn't find stations, it's a wasted investment. Then if the show doesn't do good, your show gets dropped by your stations, and it's a wasted investment. LBS at this point was known for having some financial struggles, so betting big on a reboot of Family Feud was a bold gamble, but early on it looked like it was shaping up to pay off. They got a healthy bunch of stations to commit to carrying the show, including the bulk of stations owned and operated by NBC, which automatically landed them New York, LA, and Chicago, as well as a bunch of other markets. I also found out that there was a bit of controversy when KSL in Salt Lake City declined to pick up the show, which is notable only because that is the only TV station in the country owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormon Church, of which Ray was a devoted member, one being billed as, quote, TV's first LDS game show host. Ray said in an interview that he was embarrassed and disturbed that they wouldn't pick up the show. But otherwise, Family Feud was gearing up for a big splash. Expectations were high, the show had big shoes to fill, and its competition was stiffer than ever, and it had a virtual nobody as its host. Soon enough, it hit the air. The daytime version premiered first, on July 4th in 1988. Everything's pretty much the same as in the pilot, except that they made a few tweaks to the set, including bringing back the needlepoint. 
Ooh. Also, curiously, they disposed with the option to pass or play. Everyone just plays by default. That's the only change to the format. So, outside of the pilot, how is Ray Combs as a host? Well, a lot of the stiffness of the pilot got worked out fairly early, and Ray seems a lot more comfortable. His goofy comedy was the star of the show. Can we do that? Sure, why not? <laughs> and for what it's worth, as he grew more comfortable with this show, he was able to work in a lot more subtle remarks, so don't get the idea that Ray just turned the whole show into a stand-up set. There were some notable recurring bits from throughout Ray's run. I found two examples of him deciding to let a contestant host the show while he pretended to be a member of the family, really playing up the stereotype of an enthusiastic contestant. Phil, why don't you just run the questions down the line for me? We'll take over, let me have a break, and I'll be over here with your family. <laughs> Move on, keep on moving. We, we got a tight game here between the Castellano family and the Lewis family. Phil, just ask the question. <laughs> Phil, Phil, get in the shot, okay. man. Turn around okay. and face this way so they can see you both. I'm hiding the Jesus. Now say, show me whatever he said. Okay. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Two strikes, all right. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right. All right. Come in again. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Also, in the rare event that the first Fast Money contestant won the grand prize on their own, Ray would instruct everyone in the studio to be quiet, and he would tell the second contestant that their partner had done terribly before proceeding to ask them a series of ridiculous questions. All right. There were three stooges named Curly's wife. And perhaps the most widely known was a bit where Ray would wear the high heels of women who came on the show, and was actually able to carry himself quite well. So there you have it, I guess. Dawson kissed the women, and Ray tried out their footwear. Also, speaking of Dawson, again, it was natural for people watching to compare the two hosts, and I've already done a little bit of that. But really, I think Ray Combs said it best when, in 1988, he told the newspaper, quote, People say those are big shoes to fill. I don't have to wear his shoes. I've got my own. And that's really a fair assessment. These two are very different talents. On one hand, a warm, upbeat, goofy Midwesterner, and on the other, a sharp, relaxed, wry Brit. And preference for one over the other is purely preference. I don't think it's fair to say that one is better than the other, and that's not my job anyway. The only thing that mattered was whether people were watching it. And on that note, the ratings for the first season were good, but not great. For a new game show, it did pretty well. By the season's end, it was the third most popular game show in syndication, behind the Merv Griffin monolith. That may sound great, but in reality... Eh. Okay, November of 1988 had Family Feud at a 6.4 rating, and I don't want to get too involved in what these numbers really mean, but I will say that less than four years earlier, in February of 1985, Dawson's version of the show was pulling in an 8.3, which was low enough to get the show cancelled. Now, that's not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, because the syndication landscape had changed some in the intervening years, and this revival was still brand new in November. And for a regular game show, this early performance could very well have been considered a solid performance, but for a show carrying the name of the one-time king of syndication, debuting below, like, nine, was pretty underwhelming. Now, let's back up for a second and just talk about syndication in general. For one thing, I've been referring to evening syndication as mainly corresponding to the 7 to 8 o'clock prime access hour, which was the most lucrative slot in syndication, and the one Family Feud and Wheel of Fortune most often ended up in. But stations could buy these shows and slot them pretty much wherever, meaning that depending on where you lived, Family Family Feud may have come on much earlier, maybe like 5.30, or perhaps even much later in the overnight hours. Prime access went to shows that the station had the most faith in, and by 1988, most stations already had pretty reliable shows in that time period. And if they didn't, there was bound to be someone offering them something tried and true, like reruns of The Cosby Show. So to get on in Prime access was a lot harder in 1988 than it was in 1977. And everything was about to get harder, thanks to this woman. Phil Donahue might have been the pioneer of this category of television, dubbed the tabloid talk show, but Oprah Winfrey was the one who sent it into the stars. These talk shows were built on flashy individuals, often with taboo attributes, and they were a hit with viewers and stations in syndication. This genre of television would pave the way for bona fide trash TV, first with the Morton Downey Jr. show and Geraldo, and then by 1991 they were joined by Maury, Jerry Springer, Montel Williams, and Jenny Jones, among others. If you've never experienced the joy of watching one of these shows, congratulations. This is some of what you're missing. Like a man Maybe you ought to wear a wig so you can get a I man. look a lot better. Maybe you ought to wear a wig.
people in the early 90s just ate this stuff up, and these shows came to be a big part of syndication lineups going into the early 90s. These shows were intended for the early afternoon, which was the spot that Family Feud most often landed in if a station couldn't find a spot for it in prime access. So it provided a lot of competition, especially since most of these shows had double feuds runtime. Also around this time, the company that syndicated the Merv Griffin monolith was parading around a little show called Inside Edition, a news magazine intended specifically for prime access, which accompanied fellow news mags like A Current Affair and Hard Copy to crowd things up even further. All of this is to say that the world of television was ever evolving. Family Feud was THE hot item for most of its original run, but times change. Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy had and were retaining their throne atop the syndication world, proudly airing in prime access in most markets. And the appetite for game shows outside of those two seemed to be pretty narrow, both among audiences and stations. As trashy talk shows came to dominate other time periods and reruns of off-network shows remained reliable choices, an underperforming revival of a once-dominant game show with a different look and a different host wasn't appealing to many stations. Before the end of Family Feud's first season back on the air, NBC's flag ship owned and operated station in New York had dropped the show in favor of Inside Edition. In the rough and tumble world of broadcast syndication, Family Feud had essentially one half of one season to become a hit if it wanted to have a prayer of long-term stability. It did not achieve that, and for most of the rest of its run, it skated on thin ice. But not being a runaway hit doesn't mean that the show wasn't popular. The show found an audience that was respectable for what it was, and though it didn't live up to the lofty expectations, it performed decently enough to stick around in most of the markets it aired in. And the CBS version was faring well too, having built up a sizable female audience. There was even an episode of 227, which happens to be one of my favorite sitcoms, that was geared around the main characters going on the show. Name the part of the newspaper that you read first. Oh. Michelle, are you all right? I'm fine. <laughs> Ray, as a host, was generally well received, even while he stood in the shadow of Richard Dawson. Nice. <laughs> 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 If Richard Dawson was here, the answer would have been all right. <laughs> and the fact that he no longer kissed the women was widely welcomed. All in all, the show's start, while slightly underwhelming, was good enough to get it renewed, with the hope that its adequate success would continue or even improve with time. However, that didn't really happen. Ratings slipped as the years went by, even after Ray donned a handheld microphone, which was unique, and brought his son onto the show dressed as Robin. By 1992, having fallen considerably in the day and in the evening, and now really feeling the effects of tabloid talk shows, CBS decided that the show needed work, and quick. So the show got a format change, and these changes amounted to an overhaul. The CBS version was expanded from 30 to 60 minutes, and it was dubbed the Family Feud Challenge. The time expansion meant that a single episode would consist of two individual games, with the idea being that the winner of the first game would go on to play the second game. So that's simple enough, but the rest of the changes were more complex, and they're on full display in one of the strangest pilots I have ever seen. One of the big gimmicks of this retooled version of the game was that there was no set grand prize. The the families would determine their prize based on their performance in the actual course of the game. For the first game of the hour, this came in the form of the bullseye round played at the top of the show. Ray goes to each family and drops $2,000 in their banks, that being the least they could play for in fast money. Then Ray goes to each member in each family and asks them a family feud survey question. Their goal is to give the number one answer, which will deposit $1,000 in their bank for a maximum potential $7,000 grand prize. The number two answer would be worth $500 and the number three answer would be worth $200. 50. This part of the game eats up about four or five minutes, and by the end, both families have their jackpots set, and the main game is ready to begin, and it proceeds just like you'd expect. A bunch of rounds, a winner declared, fast money played, and a lot of jumping once the family hits 200. But then, instead of the credits rolling, there's a commercial break. Welcome back, now it's time for this family to play their second game against the current reigning champs. But in this game, there's no bullseye round at the front. In fact, there's nothing in these banks at all. That's the twist of the second game. The banks are built up during the main rounds. The idea is that instead of the usual format, where each main round round is played for dollars, with 300 being the threshold for a victory, these dollars get thrown straight into your bank, making up the amount you'd play for in fast money. So instead of single, double, and triple value rounds, the game went with rounds where each point would be worth $10, $20, and $30. The bank was the scorekeeping mechanism in this game. Three regular rounds play out before we close out the game with 
the Bullseye Round. Yes, the second game had an altered version of the Bullseye Round that was played at the back end of the game. Ray started by going to the trailing family, asking each member a survey question, but in this version of the Bullseye Round, all that mattered was the number one answer, which was worth $3,000 for each question, for a maximum of $15,000 on top of any winnings from the main game. Then Ray went to the other family and did the same thing, with graphics showing the amount they'll need to surpass in order to win the game. Whichever team ends up with the larger bank is the one that will play fast money, which plays out as normal. And that was the pilot for the Family Feud Challenge. This format change was drastic, to the point of almost being unrecognizable as Family Feud. These on-screen graphics tried to make sense of it all, but they really ended up just being confusing. This was no longer a show you could just turn on and immediately know what was going on. Instead, it was hard to understand, it was clunky, and on top of everything else, it didn't really make for a more compelling game. This was a bizarre experiment, and it is truly a marvel that these ideas made it all the way to the pilot stage before Brighter Minds prevailed. That's right, this pilot must not have played well at some point along the line, because the version of the game that would actually go on the air in 1992 was more traditional. It was still called the Family Feud Challenge, and it still had the longer runtime and the Bullseye Round, but the format of the Bullseye Round was changed. Now, instead of an individual question for each player on the set, each for the same monetary value, the game kicked off with five Bullseye questions modeled as face-offs. The value of these questions increments from $1,000 to $2,000 all the way to $5,000 for a potential maximum of $15,000 if one family ran a clean sweep. But the big difference here was that it added an element of suspense. The threat was no longer just missing out on the money in your own bank, it was also potentially allowing it to go to your opponent. But unlike the last version, the outcome of the Bullseye Rounds had no bearing on who won the main game, just on the value of the prize for winning fast money. This version of the game began airing on CBS in June of 1992. As for the syndicated version, it was kept at a half hour, but it incorporated the same style of Bullseye Round, and it was renamed The New Family Feud. This version of the show began airing a few months after the CBS version. Now, in addition to the format change, the show also dialed up its reliance on celebrity teams. There were specials involving sitcom casts and wrestlers and football players and beauty pageant stars and on and on and on, all in a throw-everything-at-the-wall effort to get more eyeballs on the show. And the effort ultimately didn't work. The Bullseye Round ate up five or six minutes per episode, meaning that the main game and Fast Money had to move along very quickly to stay within their runtime. It was a pretty bloated change, even in this revised form, and I think YouTuber G$8605 summed it up best when he said, quote, Bullseye was superfluous. Indubitably. The increased reliance on celebrities didn't generate significant interest either, and probably just came off as desperate to most audiences. The show had hit all-time ratings lows for the 1992-1993 season, to the point that only 62% of CBS stations were even carrying this season of the show. And of course, the downfall of the show wouldn't be complete without some sort of controversy between the host and the show's staff. Yet again, Howard Felsher found himself butting heads with the show's star. You see, Ray Combs didn't really see himself as a game show host. He saw himself as a comedian, and Family Feud was just his vehicle to higher stardom. He publicly made the comparison between where he was in his career and where Johnny Carson was while he was hosting Who Do You Trust? This didn't sit well with Howard Felsher, who believed that the show came first. The two pretty consistently squabbled, with Ray wanting to ramp up his comedic presence and Howard wanting to maintain the integrity of the game. The relationship might not have been as hostile as the one Felsher had had with Dawson, but the bickering was prominent enough that neither man much liked the other by this point in the show's run. Ray also lost his biggest cheerleader in December of 1992, when Mark Goodson passed away of pancreatic cancer at age 77. Mark had been a loyal and vocal supporter of Ray throughout the show's run, so with him out of the picture, that meant that someone else was going to have to take the reins of the company he left behind. I wonder who it will be. You've got mail. Ah yes, Mark Goodson's son Jonathan was put in charge of the company's operations. Jonathan was 47 when his father passed, and he had worked with his father's company in legal roles and production roles for all of his adult life. But the two men were different, and decisions were about to start reflecting that. Meanwhile, in November of 1992, CBS publicly announced that the current season of Family Feud would be the last one to air on the network. The decision was twofold. Not only was Family Feud one of CBS's worst performing daytime shows, but CBS also programmed an hour more of daytime than the other two networks, and with the abundance of syndicated programming by this point, stations were demanding that time to program their own shows rather than having to put on the network lineup. So CBS made the move to return an hour's worth of daytime to its affiliates, completely dropping the 10 to 11 a.m. hour that Family Feud aired in from their network schedule. Family Feud's run in network daytime was over. 
and the show would never return. Over in syndication, things weren't much better. The show barely cracked the 3.0 mark in ratings for the 92 season, which this ad in a broadcasting magazine tried to spin as a positive. Also, this number here implies that it might not have been much more than 50% of stations that kept Family Feud around for 93. But the show was renewed and would continue on for another season. Oddly enough, this season opened with several weeks of shows shot outdoors on location at Opryland in Nashville using a completely different set and switching to an all-digital board for the first time. The whole gimmick was that several of the shows featured country music stars like Brenda Lee. Otherwise, this season was largely just a continuation of the previous one, with the bullseye round and celebrity specials and low ratings. In fact, ratings had dropped even lower by the beginning of the 93 season, and the show's distributor told the show's crew that the show was going to be cancelled. The only thing that could make them change their minds would be some other change to the show that could be used to give the unhappy stations the confidence to sign on for another season. And the solution they came up with will never cease to amaze me. The big idea was that the show bring back Richard Dawson. The rationale was simple. Dawson had hosted the show during its prime, so he was the show's best shot at a comeback. And while Mark Goodson might have sworn never to work with Richard Dawson again, Jonathan had not. A lot of the staff on this iteration of Family Feud had worked on the Dawson version as well, and many expressed concern about a Dawson comeback, remembering the oversized ego and short temper that made the latter years of the show's run an utter nightmare. But Jonathan proceeded with the plot and brought Richard in for a meeting, where everyone immediately noticed that he had aged and put on a lot of weight. This was apparently a consequence of quitting a four-pack-a-day smoking habit for his daughter. And it was because of his daughter that he was even entertaining this idea of returning to host the feud in the first place. His daughter had never seen him on stage because he had been in retirement since she had been born in 1990, and he thought it'd be fun to let her see what her father was really good at. He just had to promise her that the only woman he would kiss would be her mother. Richard Dawson signed on to host a season. Jonathan broke the news to Ray, who was blindsided. Everyone on the show was aware that cancellation was in the cards, but Ray had never considered that he'd be replaced, much less by the man who preceded him. Jonathan did his best to convey that bringing Dawson on was the only prayer the show had for survival, but the news hurt regardless. Ray was getting fired from the job he had expected to be his ticket to stardom. He took it personally, and he was distraught. He was essentially being told that he was the reason the show had failed. It would hit anyone hard. By the time Ray's final episodes were taped, he was aware of the impending change, and if you pay attention, you can catch some notes of anger-induced self-pity in some of the remarks he makes toward his final episodes. Let's start by calling for the bullseye game! Oh, how I wish it would land on me now! Then came his very last episode, where the Tran family won the game only to play one of the worst fast money games in the show's history, with the second player amassing zero points, prompting Ray to say this. Zero. You know, I've done this show for six years, and this could be the first time that I had a person that actually got no points, and I think it's a damn fine way to go out. <laughs> Thought I was a loser till you walked up here, and you made me feel like a man, man. Give me your hand. Something that should be built to last, you said? Mm. Following that, if you watch closely, Ray runs off the set instead of hanging around with the families, prompting some confusion. As it turned out, he immediately left the building, got in his car, and drove off. He did not say goodbye to anyone on staff. Thus ended Ray Combs' six-year tenure on Family Feud. Richard Dawson's return to Family Feud was set to debut in the fall of 1994. The show wanted him to be a little more presentable, and they actually included as a condition of his contract that he had to lose 30 pounds. But when time for filming came, he had not dropped an ounce. Oh well. The show also got a visual facelift. The set they went with was actually a modified version of the set they used at Opryland, with this cool stained blue glass look which turned red during Fast Money. And to drive home the cool factor, they changed the theme music to something considerably swankier. The star of Family Feud, Richard Dawson! and the show permanently dropped the mechanical board in favor of an all-digital look, which they CGI'd up for this version. There were also some changes to the format of the show. The biggest change was that for the first and only time, the show was extended to an hour in syndication. There would be two distinct games per episode, similar to the hour-long CBS version. There was also a gimmick where sometimes, instead of the challenging family in the second half being the returning champions, they would bring on some winners from Dawson's original run. The families in this run were reduced down to four members apiece, and they were introduced at the top of the show using this weird 
caricature bit? I don't know what they were thinking. Dawson was also a vocal opponent of the bullseye round and tried to get it cut from the show, but the producers wanted to hang on to it, so the compromise they settled on was a modified version called the bankroll round, which operated largely in the same way, except that the number of questions was cut from five to three, and the same two players played all three questions. These changes all amounted to far more than a simple host change. This was basically an all-new version of the show with a throwback host. It actually got some stations excited. Remember, an extra half hour to a failing show was a tough ask, so the fact that Family Feud actually held on to a decent lineup of stations was a testament to the power of the name Richard Dawson. Hopes were high once again. The revamped version of the show debuted in September of 1994, whereupon Dawson attracted a standing ovation and a notable ratings uptick, probably mostly out of curiosity. But the interest was fleeting, and within the first couple of months, the show was back in the ratings catacombs. For one thing, Dawson was a different man in 1994 than he was in 1976. He had been in retirement for almost 10 years, during which time he had been totally out of practice. His sharp wit had dulled, and his knack for family banter that had made the original version of the show so popular was no longer what it once was. On top of that, perhaps as a consequence of his longtime smoking, his voice was softer and more raspy, and he spoke in a hushed voice that occasionally made it hard to understand what he was even saying. Dawson just didn't have much personal motivation to make this show very good. He didn't need the money, he didn't need the clout, he was really only there because he thought it'd be fun. The show just didn't have the same energy of either version that preceded it, and the hour-long format made the whole thing a long, drawn-out experience without much that actually made it worth watching. And the big thing that killed any chance this version of the show might have had was the OJ trial, the trial of the century, which was going on around this time and got live coverage at every possible point, quite frequently preempting Family Feud or just drawing away viewers in a lot of markets. And the show was still up against all of the talk shows and news magazines that had given Ray Combs so much trouble. Ratings for the show were not good, and the writing was on the wall for Family Feud. The show was cancelled in syndication after a single season of Dawson comeback version. There seems to have been some effort to look into renewing the show with yet more changes, maybe even including a different host, but those did not materialize. Family Feud was over. Again. In the aftermath of Family Feud, Dawson completely retired. He only made a handful of public appearances in the following years. He hosted a Thanksgiving block on the Game Show Network in 1996, he narrated a Fox special called TV's Funniest Game Shows, and he appeared in interviews for GSN's Game Show Awards in 2009. He taped an extended interview with the Television Academy in 2010 at age 78, reflecting on his life. How would you like to be remembered, Richard? <laughs> Alive and well. <laughs> I, yeah, if that I was... I was kind, and I was a, a nice person. You wouldn't want to move if you were sat next to me on the bus. Or maybe you would. He passed away a year and a half later on June 2nd, 2012, at age 79, from esophageal cancer. His legacy in the present day, especially in the post-Me Too world, is a little complex. But his work on Match Game and Family Feud are undeniably some of the most iconic pieces of game show media in the history of the format. His legacy also lives on in the wardrobe of Columbia, South Carolina weatherman Daniel Bonds, who actually acquired many of Dawson's ties from his estate and wears them often on his weathercasts. Now, the rest of Ray Combs' life is a tragedy. Shortly after getting fired from Family Feud, he was involved in a car accident that injured one of his spinal discs, and though he did recover, his general mobility was inhibited from that point on, and he took medications to dull the constant pain from the injury. The accident kept him away from his career for many months, and by the time he was ready to come back, he was unsuccessful in finding any work in comedy. But then he entered a relationship with a company called Seagull Entertainment, which was run by the same man formerly in charge of Family Feud's distribution in syndication. The company syndicated a handful of programs, mostly cartoons, but the company had plans to launch a 60-minute Ray Combs talk show in the spring of 1995. There was a pilot taped, and it was appearing in industry publications as late as February of 1995, trying to get stations to pick up the series. At that point, 44 stations had signed on, and the show was set to clear 50% of the nation. For some reason, this project did not pan out, and sometime shortly after this page was published, the show was preemptively cancelled before it had a chance to air. This brief clip, with no no sound is the only part of the pilot that has ever surfaced. Dejected at the failure of that project, Ray took the only work he could find, which was hosting an obscure game show called Family Challenge on the Family Channel. He actually managed to bring on Gene Wood, who was the announcer for the entirety of Family Feud's existence, to announce this new show as well, in what would be his last full-time announcing job before his retirement. This show was pretty juvenile. Many of the contestants were children, and you can tell that the show was shooting more for that audience. Ray does his best, appearing to genuinely try to make this show as good as it can be, 
but he was working with limited material. It was basically a Nickelodeon caliber show, and for a man who once had high hopes for a starry career in comedy, it was demeaning work. Ray's personal life was full of turmoil as well. His finances were in terrible shape, due in part to his relentless generosity and in part to a series of bad investments in comedy clubs in Cincinnati. His Ohio home was foreclosed on, and he separated from his wife of 18 years, though a divorce was never finalized. By 1996, he had racked up over $250,000 in debt, in addition to a nearly $500,000 mortgage on his home in California. The combination of all of these factors, the debt, the breakup of his marriage, the demeaning cable show, the effects of his injury, and the general failures of his career, it all sent Ray into a depressive state, with friends noting changes in his personality around this time. The issues came to a head in late May of 1996, when Ray called his estranged wife to say his goodbyes before attempting to overdose on Valium. He was unsuccessful, and he spent a brief amount of time in the hospital before being released, though his wife noted erratic behavior from that point forward. On June 1st, he was reported to the police for causing a disturbance at his family's home in Glendale. He had repeatedly banged his head against a wall and was bleeding from his forehead. He was again taken to the hospital, and after his wife informed authorities of his earlier suicide attempt, he was put on a 72-hour psychiatric watch. But shortly after 4 o'clock the following morning, Ray hung himself with his bedsheets in the hospital room closet. He was only 40 years old. Ray has been widely remembered as an exceptionally good and kind person by figures who worked with him on Family Feud as well as by contemporary comedians. Ray had a quality that you really had to look hard to see. Behind all the pizzazz and the show business jazz and the jokes and the laughs, behind all of that, there was a young man from Cincinnati, Ohio, with an enormous heart, filled with love for people, especially children, and love for what he did. I miss Ray a lot. And on the occasion of Thanksgiving, I realize I'm extremely thankful that I was able to know Ray Combs, to work with him, to laugh with him. He was an important part of my life. We want to close this special by showing you some clips of Ray Combs at his best, which was usually the case on Family Feud. This concludes part two of the story of Family Feud. Thank you so much for watching. Tune in for the final part, part three, where we'll take a look at the version of the show that is on today. That's the one you all want to see, right? <laughs> I will see you there. Goodbye.